Hello, I'm David Rifkind, Director of the University of Florida School of Architecture, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this open house. I'm joined by Bradley Walters and Stephen Bender, who will tell you more about our Master of Architecture program, which we offer at our historic main campus in Gainesville and at our City Lab locations in Orlando and Jacksonville. Our leadership team also includes Nancy Clark, who directs our City Lab program in Jacksonville, Cameron Jacks, who manages graduate applications for the School of Architecture, and Maggie Hayes, who assists City Lab students. I'm honored to represent the School of Architecture at the number one public university in the United States, according to the Wall Street Journal. The University of Florida School of Architecture trains professionals committed to crafting a more sustainable, equitable, and beautiful built environment. We tackle the most pressing challenges of our time, including climate resilience and social equity, through critical scholarship and creative placemaking. We design the spaces that shape the human experience. We're going to introduce you to the Master of Architecture program at the UF School of Architecture and invite you to join us next year when we celebrate our centennial as the first School of Architecture and the first accredited program in the, in the state of Florida. And now, I'd like to introduce Professor Bradley Walters, Associate Director for Graduate Programs. Great, uh, thank you, David. Um, I'm happy to share some information about our programs to help you get a sense of what we do here um, and to walk you through some of the particulars of the application process as well. Um, the, the basic outline for what we're going to do today is um, as shown on this agenda and we're going we're to talk about graduate school broadly for a few moments. We'll talk about the way that we build community here, um, some of our programs of studies. We'll talk about the campus, the facilities that are available to you as a graduate student. Um, we'll uh, look very carefully and, and explicit, explicitly at our city lab facilities, which extend our global footprint considerably. Um, we'll go, go through some of the particulars of the application process, and then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A uh, as well. Just if I can, as a way of, of setting up the discussion today, I'd like to offer a little bit of a prelude um, and in this, in this way, I'd like for us to recognize the tremendous opportunities that are present here in the state of Florida. This is actually an excerpt from an article that came out just a little earlier this fall um, that noted the uh, con in incredible growth that is happening in Florida, as well as some of the particularities um, of our changing uh, demographics. Um, this, uh, they point out that Florida has um, uh, become the fastest growing state in the U.S., um, which, is, which is considerable when we look at the, the amount of people that are, that are growing each year, um, uh, the size of a whole new Miami um, in just over 12 months. The, if you look at the demographics across the U.S., we can see areas that are growing, areas that are contracting, but, um, but the state of Florida is a, a place that is seeing considerable growth. And we see that um, in a different way through these kinds of, of charts that show a, a steady increase in our population over the, the last several years. In addition to a growing populace, we also have a growing economy in Florida. And uh, whenever you look at the state of Florida compared to the rest of the, the US, uh, Florida is actually ranked fourth in terms of the gross domestic product across all industries and uh, uh, generates, the, the state generates about 1.4 trillion in GDP um, as of the first quarter of, of this year. There are a, a number of very interesting particulars uh, that we find in Florida, and um, this set of articles that were, were published go into some of those interesting aspects of the, of the place and the state, including this one that gets into this mythology surrounding the Florida man. Um, and I appreciated some of the quotes that, uh, that they included. 
in particular, this idea that Florida refuses to be pinned down. It is that, that very refusal, a resistance to being known or to being stable that continues to enthrall and delight those who speak about it. I think this is very much the, the state of the state. And I find it uh, a, a compelling motivator that helps shape the kinds of uh, architectural explorations that we can have here. Further in, in that uh, set, uh, they note that set of articles, um, Florida is the country's bleeding edge, foretelling changes from the political to the social, the eco environmental to the economic. And so I see it as a, as a tremendous place for us to conduct advanced research on the, the kinds of buildings, the kinds of places that, um, that are needed for not just today, but the, the country looking forward. And I, 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 I would like to encourage you to, to see, to recognize in many ways the future is Florida. Today we're going to explicitly talk about graduate school, of course, and, and so the, the presentation shifts at this point from being about uh, this kind of state of the state, but to really being what is it that we do here. Um, in, in many ways, I would encourage you to, to see, we think of graduate education as centered on making that matters. Um, in this case, we're looking at the UF Powell Family Structures and Materials Laboratory where um, engineers and architects, designers are able to model uh, wind effects and impacts um, on individual buildings as well as on regions. Um, the making that matters uh, is something that we do in communities, in particular the, the set of um, Puerto Rico restart meetings and um, research uh, efforts that were led by uh, professors Martha Cohen and uh, Nancy Clark um, really looked at how best to help the people of Puerto Rico as they uh, rebuilt after, um, after multiple uh, storms. Making that matters also involves direct engagement with communities. Um, here a little bit closer to home, this is Jeff Carney working with folks in Port St. Joe um, uh, as a part of his work with fiber, um, uh, Jeff has led a number of our research efforts um, that, that directly work with communities in need. Making that matters also involves thinking about the stuff of buildings, the materials, the carbon footprints um, that are uh, uh, created by the work that we do. Um, and so in our design studios, we engage materials in very direct ways. Um, and in the graduate program, we engage materials full scale as well as at a whole range of representational scales. The, the full scale work in some cases takes, uh, takes place as design build studios like these that Charlie Haley has led over a number of years. Um, our interest in making also engage, engages professional practices. This is our graduate cohort visiting the offices of Bull and Swinsey Jackson in um, Philadelphia a couple of years ago. Uh, making that matters involves direct engagement with uh, some of the difficult issues that, um, that uh, have plagued our, our society. Um, uh, in this case, we worked with a community in Okahumka, Florida, um, uh, who are, uh, that is working to restore a uh, historic Rosenwald school that was an, an African American, in an African American community there in Okahumka. Uh, Making That Matters also uh, engages a diverse set of climates and a diverse set of social uh, issues. In this case, we're working with a community in uh, Tyonic, Alaska. Um, this particular native community reached out to us because of, of uh, uh, issues with their current housing stock and an interest in looking for new models and new ways of building. Um, we've been working with them for the past two years. 
Um, and uh, in the spring of this year, this, this year, we uh, won first place in the Solar Decathlon Design Challenge New Housing Division. If I describe our pro project, or if I describe our program broadly and comprehensively, I might use these uh, phrases to help you understand what, um, what we try and do here. First, we prepare you for practice. We make buildings, we build communities, we make forward-looking, technically sound, ethically responsible architecture. Details matter. We pursue research as a top-tier research institution. Advanced, peer-reviewed research drives us. We work on the most pressing questions of architecture and life. We conduct advanced research on issues of culture and climate in Florida, developing skills that allow you to shape the buildings and cities of tomorrow. We cultivate curiosity. We ask fundamental questions about architecture and education, and many of our students participate in funded teaching opportunities. We challenge convention. We engage history and culture, science and technology, analog, digital, speculative, and the built. How will you do work that matters to you, to your community, to our shared discipline, and to humanity? Those are some questions that we encourage you to engage, to wrestle with, and to work on. Finally, we support you. Uh, our faculty are mentors invested in your success. Our program emphasizes the independent thesis or project in lieu of thesis. Today you may hear me refer to that as the pilot, uh, not because we're training you to pl fly planes, but in reference to the project in lieu of thesis, the pilot. We work closely with you as you develop your independent research work. Um, I like to think of the work that we do in the graduate program as uh, uh, helping us to learn to see with our hands. And so this emblem um, uh, comes in useful as a way to, to think about that, um, that process. In addition to the, uh, the, the thinking about the program as a whole, we also think it's important for you to understand some of the areas of faculty research that we're working on um, throughout the, the the faculty here. Um, on the, the screen, you see some of the broad categories and some of the faculty who are working in these particular areas of research. Uh, this is a continually evolving collection of interests, um, but you can see some things that, that, uh, that our faculty are really um, uh, have considerable expertise in. So the Florida Institute of Built Environment Resilience is fiber. I mentioned that a few minutes ago with reference to Jeff Carney's work in Port St. Joe. Center for Hydrogenerated Urbanism is, is looking at our coastal conditions around the world and some of the environmental challenges that we're facing. Community public interest design, a number of faculty are working in that area. Uh, with communities ranging from, uh, from those small indigenous local communities um, in Florida or in Alaska uh, to communities across the, the state and across the country. Um, we have a number of faculty working in the area of high performance buildings at a range of scales and um, uh, looking at everything from the detail or the component or the furniture fabrication up to uh, entire buildings or, or structures. Um, we have a group of faculty focused on artificial intelligence and computational design more broadly. Um, the, the group that's working on, uh, on artificial intelligence in particular, uh, you can see a, a link to the Share Lab site that, um, that includes work from Carlos, Aldana Ochoa, and Nicola Arncheck, and, uh, and others that are, that are kind of helping them work in this area of artificial intelligence. But, um, but more broadly, around them and working with them, we have uh, faculty working in computational design, fabrication, building information modeling um, that, that help extend the computational work of the faculty. Um, Hassan Azad leads our environmental and architectural re uh, acoustics research, um, and he's 
continuing to build a team around him. Uh, we have a number of faculty working in history, theory, and criticism on, uh, across a number of different areas of, of expertise. In our Orlando City Lab facility, we have the, the themed environments integration program led by Stephen Grant. And, uh, and then throughout our, our faculty, we have a number of people working on architectural education and pedagogy. Again, this is not intended to, to try and, and collect in one slide every single thing that's happening in the faculty, but I did want you to get a sense of some of the areas that we're working in and some of the people who are leading those research efforts. If I speak about the community as a whole, the way that we're building community here in our school and in our program, um, I, I can share with you a few of the, the faculty and administrators who, who lead things. Um, at the college level, our dean, Dr. Chimei Anumba, uh, heads the entire College of Design, Construction, and Planning. The School of Architecture is a part of that college. Um, and uh, working with Dean Anumba, uh, Nancy Clark is an associate dean that is uh, working on undergraduate education and facilities. Dr. Meg Portillo works with uh, graduate students explicitly and some of the research agendas of the college. Donna Cohen oversees uh, global education and is also a professor in the School of Architecture. Within the School of Architecture itself, you've already met Director Rifkind and uh, of course myself. Um, I am the Associate Director of Graduate Programs here on main campus um, and working hand in hand with me are uh, Stephen Bender and Nancy Clark. Stephen, you'll hear from in a few minutes, he heads up our city lab programs, um, uh, at, at all of our city lab programs, but focuses ex in particular on city lab Orlando um, and Nancy Clark. Um, in addition to all of her administrative responsibilities and her work with CHU, she is um, uh, managing the city lab Jacksonville uh, facility. Here in Gainesville and in Orlando, we have an administrative team that supports uh, all the work that we do. Um, these are the, the key team members. Um, and some of those, the, the two in the center, Cam, Jacques, and uh, Maggie Hayes, those are, have a, a kind of dash line around them and a star because those are the, the two principal points of contact for our graduate students. Um, Cam is uh, going to be the person who you'll deal with in a very direct way during the application process. Um, and then Cam and Maggie, uh, once you are uh, part of the program, they help to um, get you registered and help guide you through the, the uh, program. But the, the rest of the staff are really integral to getting things done here. It's a tremendous team that supports us. The, I won't go through every, uh, every word about every person here on the, the faculty, but I, I want you to see um, and be able to connect names to faces a little bit. Stephen Grant, at the far left, heads our themed environments integration program. Jeff Carney heads the fiber group. Martha Cohen, uh, the Center for Hydrogenerated Urbanism. Hassan Azad, I mentioned, heads the architectural research or acoustics research, and then uh, Carla Saldana of COA, um, working on areas of artificial intelligence and AI. Um, some additional faculty, Charlie Haley uh, works with the PhD cohort, as well as our master students, of course. Um, Albertus Wang heads our Master of Science in Architectural Studies with a concentration in sustainable design. Sarah Gamble works in uh, public interest design, Peter Sproles heads our study abroad programs, and uh, Mark McLaughlin is the as uh, associate director of undergraduate programs here in the school. Um, we have a number of, uh, of other faculty who aren't explicitly heading one of the graduate programs. I would encourage you to take a look at our website and, and learn about the faculty uh, here and the faculty that may, you may want to work with in your future studies. 
In addition to those faculty that we have right here on main campus, we have a number of faculty who are working with our City Lab Orlando and City Lab Jacksonville students. Um, these are some of those faculty um, who are uh, teaching courses this semester, um, and, and this group is continually kind of growing from semester to semester. In addition to our faculty and administrators, we also build community through a, a publication that the students craft each year. Um, so this is uh, edited um, uh, completely by our graduate student cohort. And um, the Forkers uh, publication has, uh, its most recent issue was in the spring called Ritual, that was volume seven. Um, and they're working on the upcoming volume. This is one of those opportunities that we, we uh, have for our graduate students to engage the discipline more broadly, to invite research and publication from outside the school, as well as to publish and um, develop research right here in the school. And it gives us a way to be a part of a much bigger discussion about what is architecture. In terms of our programs of study, um, we have uh, the, the, a number of opportunities for graduate students here in the School of Architecture. The, the central program, one that, that we're going to focus on primarily today, is the Master of Architecture degree program. And um, that is our NAB accredited degree. There's a statement that NAB uh, uh, provides that you can see here on the screen. But, um, but just below that, there are three tracks within our Master of Architecture program. The first track, or track one, is for those students who have an undergraduate pre-professional degree with an architecture major. Um, if you were an undergraduate student at the University of Florida, um, often you w uh, would have this pre-professional degree. Our, here at UF, it's a Bachelor of Design in Architecture. Some other institutions have a Bachelor of Science in Architecture or a Bachelor of Arts in Architecture um, that is a pre-professional degree. For those students, we offer a 52-credit graduate program. Um, uh, I'm going to skip to track three and say track three is for those students who have an undergraduate degree with a non-architecture major. So that's someone who's coming into the discipline from outside of architecture. Maybe uh, your undergrad was in interior design or con building construction um, or English or music uh, or history. Um, uh, any undergraduate major outside of architecture um, uh, could pursue our Master of Architecture Track 3. That is a, a program that has 48 preparatory semester credits followed by 52 uh, graduate semester credit hours. We'll informally refer to that as our core program, but technically it's both the core program, the 48 credits, and the 52 credit advanced program um, that mirrors Track 1. And the, the program that I skipped over was track two, which is for those students who have an undergraduate professional degree. That's typically in the US going to be a Bachelor of Architecture five-year degree program. And for those students, we have this track that involves 30 graduate semester credit hours. All of our master's programs are currently classified under SIP code 4.0201, which is architecture. Um, our PhD programs have transitioned to the STEM SIP code 4.0902. So some of you that are considering uh, a PhD degree might be interested in that. Um, and we are in, pro in the process of working on transferring our master's degrees to that same SIP code. This slide um, recaps in, in, uh, the, the three different tracks again. It does um, give me a chance to just uh, mention, I will informally refer to track one uh, as the advanced program. That is, again, for those students who have a pre-professional degree, and that is that 52 credit hour program. 
um, will refer to track two usually as a second professional degree because those students already have a professional degree. And then finally, track three is, um, is gonna, for shorthand, we'll describe it as a core program, but technically it's both core and advanced. Um, all of those degree programs require a thesis or the project in lieu of a thesis, the pilot. Um, all of those tracks, all three tracks, are NAB accredited professional degrees meeting requirements for licensure and practice in, in uh, multiple states across the, the U.S. We have a number of certificate programs. We listed a few here. I'll talk about certificates more in a minute. Um, but at the bottom of the slide, we also mention that we have a Master of Science in Architectural Studies, or an MSAS degree program. The MSAS has multiple concentrations and opportunities for individual programs of study. Um, uh, we have uh, concentrations currently in themed environments integration in Orlando, as well as sustainable design. But we're working on an AI track that uh, should be online within the next year. Um, we're also, we also have uh, options in areas of architectural pedagogy, acoustics, computational design, community design, environment, and health. Welcome, by the way. Um, uh, I did make a note here at the very bottom that, um, two notes. First, the MSAS degree programs are 32 credit programs. Those do include a thesis or a project in lieu of thesis. And um, uh, for all of the master's degrees that you might earn in our school, um, up to 30 credits of those programs can be folded into a PhD program later if that is of interest or becomes of interest at some point. Our Master of Architecture degree program, um, broadly, or if I put it all in one slide, this shows all of the different courses that, um, that you would work through as a part of that degree program. But this particular slide includes two tracks simultaneously. It's including, um, it's showing you track one, which is the advanced coursework on the right half of the, the screen. And it's showing you track three, which is both the core work over the first two years and then the advanced work here. So all of this together is the, the, the track three program, and just the right half is the track one program. Again, for those students with a pre-professional degree, uh, you'd be entering into the advanced program, and if you don't have a pre-professional degree in architecture, but you're coming from outside of the discipline, you would begin in the core program back here. Um, I should note, I will note right now, this is the, the version of our, of our curriculum that is the most condensed and compressed. Sometimes, for different reasons, students will want to um, extend their uh, course of studies um, and they'll decide, for instance, um, in our city lab programs, often we'll shift history classes to a summer or we'll move some of the electives to a summer so that we can lighten the load each semester um, and open up time for work or time for family uh, commitments. Again, those are possible. We can extend. Um, it would be hard to imagine compressing very, uh, very much from what, what you see here. The uh, students in our City Lab programs and in our IPAL program um, follow a, a little different track. I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. I'll define that IPAL as well. Um, a couple of things that you see here. The, the yellow are our design studios. Those are kind of a core thread that holds it all together. So across the, the top are all of the design studios. The kind of uh, lilac or purple blue colors here in the middle are our are, are integrated building technology courses. Um, and so there's a sequence of those as well as a, a new advanced building tech class that we're introducing in the grad curriculum. The green are the history and theory courses. Um, the, yeah, the kind of orangey color are the research methods, the research prep courses. 
And then in this final year of the MARC program, the kind of bright red is the independent thesis that happens in the final semester, as well as this kind of dark gray, which is the professional practice course um, that you take just prior to graduation. There are four electives shown here for a total of 12 credit hours of open electives, and those are truly open um, uh, across campus um, for you to take any graduate level coursework. So the, we can't take like a 1,000 level class, but we can take any uh, 5,000 or above. In the graduate program, we have opportunities for international travel and study abroad, uh, specifically right now in Vicenza, Italy, and in East Asia. Those, um, the, the Vicenza program is a fall semester long program that is based in Vicenza in Northern Italy. Um, uh, as a part of that program, our graduate students take the advanced graduate three studio, this one here at the top, and they also take a history theory seminar. They take an Italian language and culture class. There's also a, a lighting seminar that's offered there um, with some of the, with an it Italian architect. Um, but what that means is that there are a number of classes in the, the structured curriculum that we can continue to complete, even if we decide we would like to do study abroad. Um, similarly, our East Asia program uh, uh, in includes an advanced grad three studio option and a history theory credit. So you can, not only can you keep up with your studies and keep moving through the curriculum towards graduation, but you can also then um, lighten your loads for the rest of your studies because you've completed nine or 12 credits of, of coursework. Um, but those happen either in the summer in the case of East Asia or in the, the final fall semester in the case of uh, Vicen Vicenza. I mentioned uh, a moment ago that these are thesis degrees. That means that part of our curriculum is uh, helping you develop as a researcher um, and helping you to have the skills that are necessary to conduct advanced level independent research. And so that is really built around this set of three classes that, that, I, that I pointed to, the research methods, the um, thesis or pilot prep, and then the final uh, thesis semester. We have, over the last few years, started to offer some group, uh, uh, more, some, I would describe them as studio-based projects. Um, and in those cases, the studio, the students are working together on a bigger project as a group, and then they're each developing independent uh, areas of research within that big, bigger project. We have some specialized certificate and uh, concurrent degrees that are available. So currently, right now, we have um, certificates in historic preservation, uh, um, a graduate certificate in sustainability, um, both in areas of sustainable architecture at the kind of building scale or sustainable design at the planning scale. Um, in addition to the themed environments integration that I mentioned in Orlando. Um, so those are available. These are 12 credit certificates, meaning that if you are in the Master of Architecture track, you have 12 credits of electives that could be steered so that you're uh, getting an additional credential and a particular focus in your work. Um, we're working again on developing some new things like the AI certificate coming this year, um, acoustics, public interest design, health, and architecture. Um, the last little paragraph down here at the bottom mentions concurrent graduate degrees. That's where you are getting a degree here with us and a second degree in a different discipline. Um, th what's interesting for some students is that that allows you to overlap up to nine credits between the two programs. It doesn't mean you're getting like a like two for one, like I did one set of work and I got two degrees, but rather that there's some maybe courses that you would finish as a part of our program that could serve as electives for that second program or vice versa. 
Um, this is, has been of interest to some students, in particular, who were looking at urban regional planning or construction management. Those are two very popular ones uh, for concurrent graduate degrees. In addition to focusing on a certificate um, as a possibility, I'd just like to mention that we have a number of graduate seminars that we offer each year. These are some from the past couple of years. Um, they're, it's a constantly changing set of topics um, that different faculty will, will offer. Um, and it gives you a chance to decide, uh, is that more central to my area of interest? Um, then you can pursue uh, a particular particular set of electives to, to, uh, that help you along your, your way. These are some of the graduate electives that are currently being offered this fall. So you can see structural modeling, design, politics, and difference, debates and spatial justice, clocks, clouds and clocks, architecture, artificial intelligence and, intelligence and ethics. And we have uh, advanced topics in building performance seminar um, we're currently planning for a, a, a different set of eight uh, graduate electives in the spring semester. I mentioned briefly the acronym IPAL. Um, IPAL stands for Integrated Path to Architectural Licensure. It's um, uh, an opportunity for, uh, well, it's a, a, a program that you can opt into here at UF that is really focused on those students who are um, uh, working towards licensure and have, have already really started that um, uh, process. And so what's interesting about our IPAL program is that we have a set of five one credit seminars that those students take that engage very particular aspects of practice as well as licensure and exams, all that stuff. But um, but it's a way for us to, to help guide the students as they are approaching uh, testing and, um, and finalizing licensure requirements. Um, if you were coming in as an advanced student, we would ask that you have about 1,600 credits, meaning 1,600 hours of experience. Um, if you were starting as a core student, we can, we can earn all of the experience during the program. But there's a particular way that we, you fill out a form and we talk with you um, about your goals and about your work experience uh, and if, you're, if you're interested. Steve and Bender will talk about this a little bit more in a, in a few minutes. For those students who are working uh, a number of hours while they are in school, often this path is a little, works a little bit better. Um, and it's what we're showing are the same classes that you saw earlier, but now there are the addition of, of summers here, here, and here. Um, but by spreading across the, the summers now, we've reduced the number of credits per semester so that there's time that you see down here at the bottom that you could be working uh, as a student. So that's something that, that uh, that may be of interest to some of you. More broadly, we are willing and able to work with you to accommodate the particular goals and objectives uh, um, that, that may matter most to you. That may mean shifting a class. It may mean more or less credits in a given semester. Um, uh, but we want you to understand that there's flexibility in our graduate curriculum to move things or uh, to make adjustments, even if, some, even if you think it's going to be one way when you start and it changes over the course of your studies, we can, we can help accommodate those changes. Um, in terms of spaces that we use that are part of our program, um, I'm referred to it here as spaces for invention because that's really what I, I think that we're doing here is inventing. Uh, new ways of working and new ways of living. This is a, a photo from this building uh, on the, the North Lawn. Um, it's a site that's in construction right now. It's a little bit noisy and messy out there, but
but it's the location that our new collaboratory will be built. Um, you can see in, within the context of, uh, of all of main campus here, the architecture building is in the center with the new collaboratory wing just off uh, uh, to the north. And then the fine arts complex um, east of here and Rinker Hall uh, make up some of the, the main academic spaces that we use. We also have a facility in Infinity Hall that's about, uh, you can see here, thir 13 minutes away on foot or a couple minutes uh, by car. Um, there are all of our digital uh, fabrication labs are presently in the Infinity Hall facility. Those will be moving to the collaboratory in spring of 2025. We have a wood shop in fine arts, the fine arts complex in addition to studios. The, fine, the wood shop will be moving into the collaboratory. So we like the, the possibilities of having all of that right here. Um, so it's no longer a 13 minute walk, but it's a like, you know, 90 second walk. Um, uh, we have classes over in Rinker Hall, which is the home of the construction management program, but, uh, but we have a number of courses there as well. The, uh, coming soon, coming like today, uh, um, this, this semester, next semester, next year, um, this is the building that is under construction currently, the collaboratory um, uh, designed by our alumni, um, uh, Brooks and Scarpa, as well as a whole team made of other alums, so um, uh, KMF Architects, uh, TLC Engineering, Lindsay Newman, CHW, and Stellar Construction. But um, we're looking forward to having that uh, space. These are just a few of the images. You can see more images um, uh, as you walk around the site. They're all, all around the, the construction site. That will allow us to bring not just the digital fabrication like laser cutters and 3D printers, the CNC mill, but it also allows to bring some of the robotics that are currently off-site. It allows to bring those back uh, here into main campus so that we can do a lot more kind of one-to-one uh, -one work and hands-on work with them. In addition to main campus, we have our City Lab Orlando facility. Uh, I'm just kind of showing you this as a, as a geographic snapshot, and Stephen Bender will tell you more about it. Um, the JAX Lab or City Lab Jacksonville facility is uh, uh, shown here in downtown Jacksonville. And then um, our facilities in uh, Vicenza, you can see the basilica in the center of the city and we're literally uh, uh, five minutes or less on foot from, the, from, from there. Um, so with, uh, in Vicenza we have design studios, classrooms, a library, uh, and then apartments for all of our students who are part of the program. Now uh, we're gonna we're gonna switch to uh, I think to um, Stephen Bender, who is the director of the City Lab Orlando facility, just to tell us a little bit more about the City Lab programs. Thanks, Bradley. Um, I'm Stephen Bender, Associate Director of City Lab and Director of uh, City Lab Orlando. Um, who are we? What are City Labs? Um, we are the School of Architecture. We're two programs in three locations. So Gainesville, which you just heard about, along with uh, Orlando and um, Jacksonville. Um, the uh, City Labs are off-campus programs that increase access to the University of Florida degree programs in architecture, and they are designed to create um, other education and uh, collaboratory or collaboration um, opportunities. City labs are centers of uh, context specific transformational design knowledge in each location. So we intend to have, uh, to learn from our environments and to have an impact on our environments. Let's look at a, a Orlando and Jacksonville on the next slide. Uh, why City Labs? Um, with flexible degree tracks, year-round course offerings, industry marketable specializations, 
and strong connections to the professional community. Most of our students work in firms and um, we have um, uh, only one tuition rate, which you might want to take note of, especially if you are a um, non-resident, uh, so out of state or international student. Uh, each location provides students with an opportunity to study architecture and is accredited to offer the integrated path to architecture licensure, which Bradley discussed earlier, and I'll give a little more detail um, uh, to here as well. Um, our city labs offer the two degree programs, the Master of Architecture and the Master of Science in Architectural Studies, as well as graduate certificates, all that provide students the opportunity to explore ideas about architecture, sustainability, uh, and urban design. Uh, let's get some more info on IPAL in the next slide. Thanks. So in 2018, City Lab became the first program to graduate not one, but three students from the IPAL track. Uh, these students graduated and within weeks they were licensed. Um, we're proud that we've graduated the second woman IPAL student uh, in the nation, Emily Anderson, who uh, if you are paying attention in the world of NCARB, uh, has uh, the role of uh, outreach at um, NCARB. By participating in and completing City Lab's uh, program, a student with any bachelor's degree can graduate a licensed architect in four and a half years, uh, something that used to take as long as 13 years. Um, not everyone can do it in four and a half years, but we have students um, that have done that and um, are practicing in our Central Florida community now. So how is it possible to work so much uh, while you're in school? Uh, on the next slide, I'll show you one of the ways that we help. Um, Bradley mentioned some flexibility, and um, I'm thankful that he went through those tracks in such detail. Um, the IPAL track is very important, and that is one of the ways that we uh, help our students work uh, more while they're in school. Um, that's the extended track that he showed you with coursework in the summer. So we go to school all year round. Um, we also offer many, but not all, of our courses in afternoons and evenings. We are not a night school, let me be very clear about that. Um, but another help that we have is hybrid format course offerings. And so most of you could expect that your studios will be offered in the hybrid method where 21 to 51 or 21 to 50% of the course will be in person. And you're seeing two examples of that on the right of the slide, where as much as 50% uh, is in person or as little as 21%. The ratios depend on the courses, the objectives, and of course, the strategy of the instructor. So it will vary. Um, we've learned what we do well online and what we do better in person. And um, our instructors make good use of that. City Lab Orlando was already set up with Zoom technology before COVID uh, back in 2018. Uh, originally, we did this to connect to main campus, and that's still one of the strengths that we have uh, through that uh, technology. Our Zoom rooms uh, allow us to connect, well, like I am to you right now. Um, now we mix in in-person and online learning. And Orlando typically means that 50% of your studio will be in person. So that's basically one studio meeting out of the two per week. Um, however, hybrid means something different in Jacksonville, which I'll show you on the next slide. So Jacksonville shares courses with Orlando. So many of the courses, uh, supporting courses, will end up being primarily distance courses, where 80 to 99% of the courses online. Um, However, Jacksonville Studios, while they're still hybrid, uh, have something that we've invented uh, called intensives. Um, these intensives have shorter online meetings each week and then intense in-person workshop sessions about five times a semester. So students in Jacksonville, um, the students that are in, it, in Jacksonville can choose to attend in person if they want. But this also means that you might be in Miami, like some of our students, and 
uh, attend City Lab Jacksonville and uh, be successful because you can make those meetings during the week and you can make the in-person sessions periodically. Bradley showed that IPAL MR curriculum path. And uh, as I mentioned, that's another way that we do it. Uh, reducing the credit hour load each semester means that you have more uh, of that 40 to 60 hour work week uh, to spend time in firms so you can work, study, and take exams strategically. That spells success for a student enrolled in our MR program and uh, IPAL. Let's look at the next slide. So Bradley showed you our faculty already on an earlier slide. Um, some of the faculty were not necessarily on that slide. And that's, it just depends on who's here uh, now versus next semester or the semester after. But I wanna point out that um, we have many professionals from our community, some of them that are our alumni uh, that join us teaching studios and other uh, supporting courses every semester. And they're as much a part of uh, the team that's dedicated to your success as our full-time faculty. Um, we're very happy with the way that we've been able to engage with that community and um, allow you to uh, experience their expertise. Eugene DeMasso uh, is a healthcare architecture expert. Uh, Peter Hall, uh, a well building expert. Philip Lantry, uh, excellent uh, construction administration architect. Brittany Gacy, working in themed environments in uh, special constructions. Uh, Chad Jones in uh, higher ed. Um, uh, Lucas uh, Najula working in um, healthcare architecture, but also in technology. In this semester, we have Damon May, who's one of our uh, UF alumni, uh, who pretty much did a clean sweep at the AIA Florida Awards this year. Malcolm Jones, a, an emerging, a young architect, um, who uh, works on us, uh, works with us on technology, but also works uh, with us at City Lab uh, on events and um, working on uh, creating opportunities uh, for connection and service in our uh, Orlando area. He's the founder of uh, something called Black Architects in the Making. Take a look. All right, next slide. Uh, okay, so how did we get here? Um, the first city lab was Orlando. The Orlando architectural community imagined that the degree path that would help create and keep talent in the region. And uh, you're seeing here uh, the history, which I'm not gonna go through, but I will simply say that UF worked with Valencia and UCF to create a bachelor's degree program, uh, which opened in 2010. We then became the graduate degree program that followed that. Um, and so, uh, by 2014, our initial cohort graduated. Now, um, we're in a 7,500 square foot facility in downtown Orlando, and we have an annual enroll enrollment of over 100 students in both architecture and themed environments integration. Um, and we have a second location now in Jacksonville, Florida, Jack's Lab. Let's take a closer look at that on the next slide. Okay, sorry. We're gonna look at the facility in Orlando first. Uh, my notes are wrong. <laughs> so we're smack in the middle of downtown Orlando. There are two dozen high quality architecture firms within a 10 minute walk of this uh, location. And of course there are restaurants, entertainment, parks, and sports as well. So while we don't have the things you would expect from a college campus, which are all great, we have uh, things you would expect uh, from a city. So let's look at our facility next. So we're, like I said, 7,500 square feet on the fifth floor of a building. We look out at, um, uh, at over most of the buildings around us uh, with great views of the sports venues, the soccer stadium, the Amway uh, facility and on the other side, um, uh, the, the city core. Um, our facility, um, following the pandemic, we stopped old desks pretty much. And we reimagined the way things work. So rather than a conventional field of tables, we arranged into a flexible activity-based working scenario 
And so that's what you see here. Um, we've created centers of activity for building models using um, high powered computer workstations or studying together and make it all more enjoyable. Um, provide the basic tools uh, that can be checked out from the library, like drafting boards, uh, et cetera. We even have uh, uh, Dremel tools and other small tools available for you here. Um, a lot of people have called this kind of way of thinking, meeting, working, collaborating, intentional presence. And um, I really like that pair of words. And I think it pretty much says how students in Orlando who are so busy uh, organize themselves to get together and do architecture school. Uh, next slide. So the tools. Uh, we have a computer lab in the studio with workstations and landing stations where you can come plug your laptop into monitors. We have 3D printers, uh, basically a 3D printer farm uh, right in the studio and a laser cutter in the studio. This is true of both Orlando and Jacksonville. Um, of course, we've got small tools like uh, Dremels, uh, cutting tables, um, and even more. Uh, next slide. Now we'll go to Jacksonville. All right. So City Lab Jacksonville, directed by Nancy Clark, builds upon the success of Orlando. Shared courses and the overall mission um, uh, make it possible. Um, Jax is one of the fastest growing cities in the US and has a growing focus on tech and resilience. And we're plugged in there. Uh, this fast growing program has 16 students this year. Um, and we look forward to increased enrollment next year. Um, let's take a look at our location. So we're, um, while approvals, plans, and renovations are being completed for a permanent facility in Jacksonville, uh, we have uh, a range space in expansive uh, workspace. This is a co-working facility. It's a great space to be in. Uh, it's active with community entrepreneurs. Um, it's full of social activities. It's really actually a great way to get plugged into what's happening in Jacksonville. And we occupy a big part of the ground floor. It's a half block from the river. Um, and uh, inside there's a shared kitchen, lounge, work area, and then this garage space you see on the right. And like Orlando, it's 24 seven access. And uh, we've got work tables, seating, Zoom card, 3D printers, all that good stuff uh, right in the space. It, it opens out onto an alley also, which you can't see here but just another cool uh, space. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the Jacksonville program benefits from Jacksonville's unique urban context with this emphasis on design at the intersection of the natural and the constructed environment. Uh, like many Florida cities, it has a pretty intense relationship with the water. Uh, and that's the St. John's River there you see in this image and the downtown uh, uh, meeting that edge. We spent a lot of time in here and we spent a lot of time on the creeks and the rivers and the neighborhoods that abut them. Um, this results in a lot of opportunities to engage in research with the centers like Fiber uh, and Center for Hydrogen and Urbanism, which Bradley mentioned earlier. Um, Jack's Lab offers all the same degrees as main campus and um, City Lab Orlando, uh, but focuses uh, primarily on sustainability. Um, I've got Nancy's contact up there. I'm sure you all will be able to find that online as well. If you have questions, please reach out to her. Um, but we do more than school at City Lab. Uh, let's see on the next slide. Uh, this is a messy slide, and I couldn't figure out how to not make it messy. Uh, life's kind of messy. Architecture school's messy. City Lab can get messy. We have a lot of special guests and events, happy hours with alumni and firms, and we go out into the city and serve as well. Um, and we even have a student-run podcast that you could find up there as well. If you want to know more about what's going on in City Lab Orlando, please follow our Instagram account. We do post that regularly and both kind of a, uh, here's what we're doing that's interesting. And also like, here's what we're doing for your information. Uh, it's one of the ways we communicate with students. 
So you could kind of get a feel for how that goes um, by following us. I look forward to meeting all of you. Thanks, Bradley. Okay, so um, thank you, Stephen. That's great. Um, the from here, um, we're gonna we're gonna start to wrap things up in terms of the, the presentation. Um, but the the next piece is really just focused on the admissions process and um, and what that looks like. And so we start in this way: like, are you ready? Do you want to be ready? <laughs> are you interested? Um, uh, the admissions process is um, relatively straightforward, um, but to begin, the application deadline is the 1st of January uh, each year. Um, there's a link uh, just under that that, um, that you could find pretty easily, but it's just our uh, uh, architecture website slash graduate dash program dash application. Um, what you'll see is that there's a set of specific requirements. So first, there's an online application that's the same for, uh, for any program here at UF. On your application, we ask that you make sure that you self-report your GPA. Um, and we say that because it, it is a particular, um, a common thing that, that flags your application if you don't do that. Um, and it delays uh, our review of it. Um, if you are currently a UF student, as in one of our undergraduate programs, or if you've completed one of our undergraduate programs here at UF, and you are applying, you, whenever you're asked if you are applying for readmission, we just want you to know you shouldn't be saying no, because you ha are not being readmitted to our graduate program. Um, that, that it's a, I know that that leads to some confusion sometimes, but if you're a graduate student in our program, you may be applying for readmission. There's a, an application fee of $30, and then there are a set of things we ask you to include. So there's a letter of intent where we're asking for you to detail your motivations. Why are you applying for our program? We're interested in understanding if there are particular areas of interest that you wish to pursue. Um, we're interested in understanding a little bit about you. What is it that you bring with you? What is your lived experience? How does it frame your work? Um, we would like to know what program location you are interested in, um, whether it's Gainesville, Orlando, or Jacksonville, um, and why. Those are some, some common parts. I'll talk about the letter in just a little bit more detail in a second. Um, we do require that you submit a resume or a curriculum vitae that is a, a, a straightforward summary of your education, work experience, awards, or publications. Um, uh, it is also required by state law that you identify any ongoing international affiliations, um, in particular, um, that may involve research funding. That's, uh, that's not for us, that's for other people to, uh, to look at. Um, in addition to those things that are submitted with your graduate application, then we're gonna ask that you um, have other documents sent to us on your behalf. So first, for any students or applicants who are non-native speakers, um, you are required to take the test of English as a foreign language and submit those um, results to us. Uh, you can see here expected minimum scores for that e exam. Um, we do require official transcripts from any institutions that you've attended. You should know that the university requires a minimum of a 3.0 GPA. If your GPA is close to 3.0 and not quite 3.0, we can look at it. We, we will look at it carefully. If it's far from 3.0, then recognize that that's, uh, that's probably a, a problem. Um, but still, reach out if, if, uh, if you'd like and we can talk through possibilities. 
Um, you are required to submit three letters of rec recommendation. We are interested in those letters being from people who are qualified to assess your possible performance in a graduate degree program. So that's different than like um, maybe uh, someone that you know from church or from a social uh, world where maybe they don't know your ability to perform in an academic environment. So um, sometimes a, a, a prior supervisor at a work experience might be relevant or someone from the world of education. Those are things you're going to ask to be sent to UF. Um, for the recommend, recommendations in particular, you'll give uh, on your application, you'll identify a name and an email address and everything then happens digitally from that point. So there, a request goes to a, your people and your people submit letters digitally on your behalf and they come straight to the graduate school. Sorry. Um, finally, uh, we require that you assemble and submit a portfolio. If you are an advanced student, uh, you probably have a lot of work. Um, hopefully, you have a lot of work to share. Um, and we're interested in seeing that work and understanding your uh, uh, design processes. If you are not an advanced student um, and you're just getting going, we're still going, going to ask for a portfolio, but with, with uh, some different requirements, which I'll take you through. Um, you may notice on the slide, and now highlighted in, in yellow or gold, um, we do not require the GRE. So um, some schools still do require that, um, but none of our master's programs require GRE. For the letter of intent or the personal statement, I've put together a few thoughts um, that, uh, that you can, can take a look at, but, um, but I'd like to just point to a few uh, excerpts from this. When, specifically, when I pick up your letter of intent, I'm looking for you to open a window into your mind. We're trying to learn something about you, to discover how you see the world and your place within it. Um, it should be personal, but not trite, effusive, overly sentimental. Try to avoid academic or professional jargon. We don't, don't need it, but we really need a, a clear and relatively concise statement. What is it that you are, are, are what is it that best de defines you? We are interested in understanding the story of you in architecture, past, present, future. Um, and uh, alongside that, what is your lived experience? How does this frame your work? Those are important things, and those are things that often will only live in this document, in your application. And so we'd like for you to take advantage of it so that we understand you a bit better. Um, I, I didn't highlight it, but do recognize that there is uh, a lot of writing in graduate school. Um, there's a lot of writing in practice. and. Um, if we think about that as a set, particular set of skills that we're interested in uh, you having as you arrive and then developing in our program, this is also a kind of de facto writing uh, uh, sample, right? So um, do check it, have someone check it on your behalf, read it, help you to make sure that you don't have obvious errors in terms of the portfolio, we don't require a specific format for that, that document, but what I ha am showing you here is that we would prefer a page size that's an eight and a half by 11, um, then presented as a series of two page spreads, because we're gonna look at these primarily digitally, um, and so we would encourage you to present your work in landscape orientation as opposed to vertical orientations. You can see some notes here. Um, if you have completed a pre-professional degree, we're interested in seeing your strength in conceptual design, critical thinking, understanding of architectural conventions, including plan, section, 
elevation, three-dimensional diagrams, renderings, physical models, all that kind of good stuff. For applicants without extensive backgrounds in architecture, the portfolio should demonstrate other related visual or conceptual thinking skills that may include freehand drawing, painting, photography, furniture design, construction, even free verse or critical writing um, can be really great in a portfolio. There's no limit on the number of pages other than the fact that the final file has to be small enough to be able to, sent by e be, able to be sent by email. So uh, uh, within the university, we've seen, you know, often we can get uh, easily a 5 meg file, a 10 meg file, probably a 12 meg file, but as you go from 12 up to 20, there's a, there's a line somewhere in there. So um, uh, uh, take that into consideration as you think about your, your document. If you're not sure and you want to uh, send us a test, um, literally to, to kind of check a file size, uh, even if it's not a version of your portfolio, but you want to, to make sure that it can arrive to us, you are welcome to do that. Just please tell us what, you, what you're doing, right? Attached is a test file. Please let me know if, it, if you receive it so that I know that I can send you um, a file of this size. A couple of particular requirements for the portfolios. Please include your name. Um, please include a table of contents. Identify academic, personal, or professional projects. Each project should include a title and dates. Include site location information where relevant, include some narrative text outlining design motivators, conceptual ideas, formal processes. We are not just interested in a collection of, of pretty pictures, even if they're really pretty. We're interested in understanding something about the ideas that are, that are developing. Um, you should include a note or label indicating whether the work was academic, professional, or personal. If academic, provide the name of the faculty member who you worked with as an instructor or critic. If professional, include the name of the firm. If for some reason there's a, uh, a requirement that the firm says they can't be identified uh, in some way, then we would ask that you, that you include that statement right, for confidentiality. If it is a group, team, or professional project, you should list the names of all collaborators on the project. Um, provide a description of the applicant's individual con contribution to the work. So if it's a question of saying, she did this and I did this, um, that's fine. If you said, we all did everything 50-50, that's fine too, right? Um, but just be clear about it. Um, and finally, if you include any work that is not your own. So if it's a quote, if it's a photograph, if it's a, a design model that was created by someone else, you absolutely need to include appropriate citations so that we understand that was by her and this is by me, right? Um, electronic portfolios are sent by email as .pdf files. We're asking that you send a single portfolio file uh, to Cameron um, at this uh, email address. Online portfolio links or links to Dropbox folders or other places are not accepted. This is, um, I've included this, but it's all available on our website. Um, but it, this is really shared with you as a reminder so I can tell you it is available on the website it's on our admissions page so you can take a look but what we did is put together for the track three program so the full core and advanced program we put together some some cost numbers to kind of count up tuition to count up uh, other expenses that are anticipated um, there's a column for main campus there's a column for city lab um, there is a different fee structure for the two different programs, and um, and so you can can see that there's what you'll uh, these main campus numbers on this slide are for Florida residents. If you're an international student, of course your your numbers are higher. 
Um, and in that case, you might find that City Lab is actually less expensive. Uh, well, you will find that for sure. Um, so consider, look at the, the detail. I'd encourage you to take a look on the website and, and uh, see the, the particulars. We do have a number of funding opportunities available, including graduate assistantships, fellowships, and scholarships. On main campus here, um, we do offer a, a number of teaching and research fellowships. Each of those comes with a non-credit tuition waiver, as well as a weekly paycheck um, or a stipend. Um, the tuition waiver means that non-credits uh, non of your uh, coursework is, uh, is tuition free, right? Um, so it's a, there's considerable value in those. Um, you do have to work as a part of that, of course, but, um, but uh, approximately a third of our students here on main campus in our graduate programs are uh, in those funded positions, working as GTAs, teaching assistants, or graduate research assistants. The, um, we also have at our uh, City Lab facilities, we have fellowships that are available to support faculty teaching and research. We, we don't have um, uh, GTA positions per se, but we have a, a, a different, this other fellowship option available to you. And in both locations, we do have some merit-based scholarships that, um, that we award each year during it, the admissions process. For um, during admissions, we will make a number of, of offers that include an offer of admissions, um, uh, but in cases where your, your application is strong enough, we may include offers of one, two, or four semesters of GTA work, G GTA or GRA, and, we'll, um, and we can include some amount of scholarship assistance. We'll do that in the application process. And then um, often students uh, will ask us, what about applying for open positions after that point? Um, we typically do retain a, a number of positions that are open for our in, either incoming or returning students. And, um, and so for those, we ask that you identify, let us know your interest, specific areas of uh, strength and um, and then we can review your your application there are periodically open research positions that are funded um, through particular faculty research e efforts some of those that are happening right now include work with jeff carney in uh, the fiber group um, nancy clark in sustainable planning um, Carla Saldana, I mentioned earlier, um, working in AI. She has a, a team working with her. And uh, Sarah Gamble working in community design or public interest design. But, um, but those uh, opportunities will change from semester to semester and new opportunities um, will continue to emerge. There are other opportunities for working on campus, including on-campus jobs, federal work study that you can take a look at um, in addition. Um, finally, um, in terms of questions, uh, uh, if the one question that I'll just put uh, uh, raise, if you would like to get a copy of this presentation um, as a PDF document, um, please uh, leave your your email address with me, and I can send that to you. I'm happy to do that. Or if for those of you online you're welcome to um, send me an, an email. My email address is here on the slide. It's bradley.walters at ufl.edu. You can reach out to me with any questions about anything we've talked about today. Um, if you have particular admissions related questions, um, you can touch base with me, but you can also reach out to Cameron Schock, who is literally sitting 20 feet from, from us right now. Um, uh, he is supported by Maggie Hayes, who is in our City Lamp Orlando facility, uh, Pat DeJong, which is, who's one floor up, an academic advisor, and Caroline Welch, who manages the whole office here. Um, so those are all kind of backup people uh, to, to touch base with. If you have particular questions about the certificate programs, 
you're welcome to reach out to individual faculty, Nancy for sustainable design and architecture, or Cleary Larkin for historic preservation. If you have questions at the operational level for the school, David Rifkind, uh, who's here today, is our director. Um, the IPAL program and City Lab Orlando questions can go to Stephen Bender, who you heard from a minute ago, City Lab Jacksonville, Nancy Clark. And then, in, as I pointed to early in some of the faculty areas of research, if you have particular questions about an area of research and want to talk with faculty or who are working on that, you can always uh, go directly to those faculty. Um, you can also go directly to me if you said, I'm curious about public interest design and I remember your email address but nobody else's, then reach out to me and I can help you get to those people. Um, but if you uh, are interested in touching base with particular faculty, you can do that. This um, QR code up here just takes you to our How to Apply page um, directly. Okay. Thank you, Bradley. Sure. So um, I don't know if... We're happy to answer questions from our audience here in Gainesville or yeah. from anybody online uh, on Zoom. Zoom land. <laughs> you can think it's okay. I don't mean that we don't want to put you on the spot here. So if, you, if you're joining us uh, by Zoom, uh, please just uh, enter the question in the chat and we'll answer it for you. Of course, I can't see the chat, but maybe Nico can click it. Could you wave application? So um, we, we do not have a mechanism for waiving an application fee. Um, that is a common question, um, in particular for some international students. Um, there is no process to do that here at UF, um, so unfortunately not. I was going to ask, if you do graduate from City Lab after the four and a half years, do you automatically get your license, or you have to then take your test off time? You're like more prepared for it. So um, uh, I'm going to just repeat just to make sure other people can hear. The, the question is, if I graduate from Orlando City Lab, um, do all the, the requirements, do I automatically uh, receive uh, an architectural license? And, then, and the simple answer is no, um, but um, if you were part of our IPAL program and you um, finished your degree requirements, um, and as a part of IPAL, uh, we help you to complete your um, work experience. Um, if you do that, right, you complete your work experience, you got all the required hours, you worked in a firm, you did what you needed to do, um, uh, that's the next step. And then if, as a part of IPAL, you finished and took all your exams, then when you graduated, you would have all of the requirements to be licensed. You wouldn't technically just become licensed, but at that point, if you did those things, um, we, we refer to them simply as experience or education, experience, and exam. The, ex the education is your, your work in the program, the experience is your work in offices, the exam is the, the six sections of the ARE. Once you've completed all of those, then we're only talking about a, a paper process with the state of Florida. There's a formal application that you submit, there's a fee you have to pay to the state, um, and then the state can grant you a license to practice. But that's that's the formal process. Um, there is that last step that is the, the state. If you went through the program, whether in Orlando or Jacksonville or here, if you went through our program and finished your degree but didn't have your, your experience finished or your exams, then those, that would be the next thing you'd do. Opportunity um, that is offered here is that offered at City Lab, Orlando as well. The question is: Is the GTA our GTA positions offered at City Lab, mm -hmm. um, as well as main campus? And um, we don't have a GTA position um, available in City Lab, principally because 
uh, well, there are different funding systems, but also, more importantly, we don't have an undergraduate student body in Orlando. We have only a graduate student uh, student's body. And that it, it's hard for, a, or impossible really, for a grad student to teach a grad student that's pretty close in level. Um, uh, most of our graduate students who are teaching on main campus are teaching in our undergrad courses. So while we don't offer GTA positions, we do have other funded fellowships that um, allow you the financial support, the benefit of a financial support. It just, it, it, it follows a different structure. Uh, graduate teaching and assistant position, mm -hmm. do you need any particular credentials in order to be offered that opportunity? Like a number of hours of TA initially before doing that? So um, we do look for TA experience, but we don't require a certain number of hours. That I should say, the question is, are there particular requirements for uh, consideration as a GTA position? Um, so if you have worked as an undergraduate teaching assistant, um, that is very helpful. If you've completed the teaching methods class, very helpful. And we had asked that you identify that in your letter. Um, but if you said uh, that um, you had worked as a TA in three classes and you'd only worked as a TA in two classes, doesn't necessarily give you the edge, right? Um, what we are going to look at, in addition to your letter and that prior bit of experience, we're going to look really carefully at your portfolio and at your transcript. So the portfolio is a key criteria for any of the studio-based teaching, of course, because if, if you're going to be in a studio, we want to understand how you are developing as a designer. Um, but the, the transcript is because we are going to look at how you did in classes that we might need to put you in. So if I am looking for a teaching assistant, a graduate teaching assistant for History 3, then I'm going to want to know that you are doing well or you did well in History 3. Um, or an equivalent if you, if you were at a different university. Um, uh, if you struggled in a tech class, then we're not going to feel confident putting you in a tech class. We're going to want to find a good fit. Um, this is like a little bit off topic, but when looking at portfolios, are you, like from previous students that went to UF, are you expecting some like internship work is that like something you expect or is it like better to have that or are you even looking for like projects that we do aside from architecture like is that something that's important um the question is uh, are we looking for in the portfolio are we looking for uh either professional work extracurricular work work outside of the traditional studio sequence mm -hmm. um in addition to uh, regular, let's say, re regular coursework or studio projects. Um, as, a, as a basic statement, I would say no, we're not explicitly looking for those things. But similar to the way I talked about your personal statement, th they're, depending on your experience, um, it could be an important part of what defines you. And, um, and in those cases, if, if you have done something that is meaningful or that you feel is particularly good, strong, whether it's professional, extracurricular, whether it looks, looks like a building or not, um, I would say definitely include it um, because it's going to help us to get to know you. But, um, but similar to, to the, the how many teaching assistant positions have you had in the past, it, it won't automatically uh, disqualify or qualify you for something, it's going to depend on the, the, the situation, right? Um, sometimes we'll have students who have done undergraduate research with a faculty member or, um, or independently. Sometimes we have students who have worked on the NOMA competition um, uh, entry or um, something with AIAS that they want to share. Uh, sometimes it's totally extracurricular or professional, like you mentioned. And um, I would say if it's something that is meaningful to you, then include it.
Yeah. I have a question in a similar vein. If we're from undergrad here, is there value in showing like lower division work if there's not like a site or if it's not like a physical building? If we have all our upper division work or is it like good to have a mix? So, uh, the question is, is it good if you are coming from UF, um, if you've done your undergraduate work here in our program, is it good to have lower division work in addition to upper division work, knowing that some of that lower division work might be more conceptual, might be sightless, or might be uh, uh, more uh, formative exercises? Um, personally, I would say uh, it depends on the, the work. And if the work is good work, then I would include it regardless of level. And I, and I, uh, at the same time, I would not just include all of your work because you have the work. So that means you're going to look at each of your projects. Uh, maybe that project that you did in whatever, Design 2, was really great, and you should include it. And maybe it was not great, and maybe then you should leave it out, right? Um, but I would say include good, strong work um, if it helps us to understand your abilities and the way that you're seeing things. Yep. Sorry. If we have like something from a project, like say like a D1 project where it's like I didn't like my model, but it was a really strong drawing, like do I need to show a full project or could I have like a page of my portfolio where it's just like kind of like spotlight drawings that I've like done over the years? So um, if I if I'm the question is if I'm including if I include a project do I have to include all the project or can I just edit it selectively is that a fair yeah. fra phrasing um, I would always say that uh, to you that it's your work and you should present your work in the strongest way possible and so if there was a section that was not not good then don't include it right or or uh, I'll, I'll say it some students will go back and rework those right so that's not like a no-no or it's not like uh, that's a bad like she broke the rules because that's not the way it looked in design four that's the way it looks after four years of education or maybe even professional education or professional work you, she went back and worked on all these things and they look so much better now that's okay, right? It's still your work. It'd be different if it's different if you like if you if you asked him to go work on them for you. That's a, there are other problems there, right? But um, I would say select your best work and include your best work. And if it means that you are making a project with uh, one spread instead of three spreads, that's okay. Or if you said like you just suggested. Can I just have a section that is like uh, like drawings or a section that is, I don't know, uh, development or conceptual models or something, right? You could do that. You could gather them together in that way. Or you could uh, say, I'm, I'm, uh, here's a section on uh, lower division work. And you could just you know, pick and choose the pieces that you really like. Would it be frowned upon to have too much writing in your portfolio, like explaining the narrative and like your thought process? Um, so the question is, is it frowned upon um, if we have too much writing? And uh, I suppose that's a possibility, um, but I have never seen a portfolio with too much writing. I've seen several with too little writing. Um, so uh, I'm not saying that to encourage you to like write a book and send it to us. Um, you know, if you if we think about it from the review process side, we're going to have a team of faculty who will be looking at your portfolios. They'll be looking at a lot of portfolios, some from UF, some from other places. Um, uh, they'll be going through and trying to understand how you work, how what your abilities are. Um, but if you said my portfolio is, um, not that you're suggesting this, but if you said my portfolio is 200 pages and her portfolio is only 20 pages, it, it, 20 pages could be fine. And 200 could just take us longer to get through 
and maybe you could get it to the 20 pages and you know um, so I would say write what you need to write to tell us the story but um, but don't uh, add more uh, uh, if you've already kind of made the made the point so I'm, you're welcome to jump in on any of these if you want there's some more questions from the chat one is about what is involved asking about undergraduate programs and the funding opportunities. The second one is asking a specific question. Some is from Ghana, and English is their official language, but they studied elsewhere in a different language. Are they still supposed to take the language exam? Okay, so let's say for the undergraduate, um, the question was: uh, Are there about the undergraduate program? Are there are there funding opportunities? I guess if I said it simply. Um, in, so um, at UF, there is an Office of Financial Aid, uh, Student Financial Aid, that um, is really focused on supporting students um, a, through a wide range of tools. So some of those include um, direct grants, um, some of those are uh, scholarships, some of those are um, loans of various kinds. Um, that it is happening at the university level, and we would encourage you to reach out to Student Financial Affairs for the details of, of those options. In the school, we do have a, a, a modest pool of scholarship assistance that we extend to our current undergrad students, um, but really that's a, that's a, a Best can best thought of as a as when your economic situations change during the program. It's not really a, a source of funding that we encourage our students to lean on or rely on. Um, we really would encourage you to talk with Student Financial Affairs. Um, specifically um, for a student from Ghana who may um, be applying to our program, who's uh, native language is English and um, who has studied somewhere else that was a uh, non-English language uh, uh, place. Um, I guess uh, I, to, to be, the question is, do I still need to take the TOEFL and submit scores? Um, and I, uh, I don't know, David, if you have a definitive answer to that. My sense is that the, the way that um, the grad school looks at it, if you are from a non-English speaking country, um, and so if, um, if a native language was English regardless, you should, shouldn't have to take the TOEFL. Um, if there's a question that comes up during the application process um, about your particular situation, then of course we can, we can work through that with you, but my understanding is you wouldn't have to take the TOEFL. And that's correct. Uh, <clears throat> students who come from a country where the official language uh, is, uh, is English are not required to take uh, TOEFL. No more questions? No more questions. Any more questions for you all? <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you. And Bradley, thank sure. you and Steve and uh, for uh, this presentation. Thank you for coming. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you all.